I am here to give God some praise. Acceptance, sure we'll find it here. Authenticity in this atmosphere. Anticipation with a lot of action. We take it so far. Welcome to the lighthouse, lighthouse. Let me introduce you to my father. Welcome to the lighthouse, lighthouse. His name is Jesus the Christ. Let me introduce you to my father. I believe that we owe God a praise. Number 23. Acts chapter 23. And let's look at verse 12. I'm going to read it in the Message Bible so that you can get the story because it's, it's a little uh, difficult. I'm, I'm going to stop reading just, just about when I feel that you have the, um, the tempo of the story. And, and I'll be finished. So the Bible says in verse 12, the next day the Jews worked up a plot against Paul. And they took a solemn oath that they would not eat or drink until they had killed him. You'd be surprised at how many people will go without their necessities to make sure you don't have yours. And guess how many of them it was? Over 40. And that's how important you are, that people have to recruit to keep you from getting to your destiny. How many of y'all have felt that lately? You starting to feel like, you know, you introduced them and now all of a sudden they, they working together and hanging out and, and, and they're doing things because you have to understand that the anointing on your life requires all of hell to come up against you. And you're going to start to get it. It'll be in your health. It'll be in your family. It'll be in your finances. It'll be in every area where you thought you were fortified. But I promise you, don't worry about it. Somebody say, this is protection. Let's go to the next verse. Let's look at verse number 13. The Bible says this and uh, it says that they, they themselves, they plotted to murder him and they made a pact together to do it. Uh, and this wasn't, on lo this wasn't a low level hit. This was the high priest. Uh, this was all of the people who were there together. But, but here's what the Bible says. But we need your help. They're sending this letter to the governor, sending a request from the council and the captain to bring Paul back so that you can investigate the charges in more detail. And then, and then they said, watch this, we will do the rest. Before he gets anywhere near you, we will have killed him and you won't be involved. I read that in that text so that you can understand that Christians are crazy. <laughs> this, this, ain't, this, ain't, this ain't worldly people. We're talking about Pharisees, Sadducees. We're talking about people uh, who, are, who are men and women, are supposedly men and women of God. But let me tell you something. People will come out of religion real quick when they're jealous of you. They'll be shouting, but then you, you come across them and, and, they, and they can't say, and here's the problem. They, they really wanted to be Paul. So when people want to be you, they try to discredit you. By discrediting you, then people will look to them for the answer because they're the one that revealed the solution. Does this make sense? Now, I want you to get this in your head because when I finish preaching this, I hope you understand this, um, this, this idea that you are under attack, listen to me, you are under attack and it is not your fault. I need you to, because your neighbor, they hear me, but they don't get it yet. Just tell your neighbor, it ain't your fault. Okay? It is not your fault. I know, I know you feel like it, um, but it isn't your fault. And I, I've been vacillating all day long about what to call this. I, I mean, I, I had this subject and then I had that subject. But here's the real substratum of it. And, 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 and here's the thought that I want you to understand. That there is a point and a reason that you are going through, listen, these scheduled attacks. I'm not, I'm not talking about this you know, this attack that, that just came up on you. You can handle those. But I want to talk to you today about the purpose of scheduled attacks. 
why you cannot get to the next level until you get through this trouble. And you can keep skipping this class, but you're going to be in this grade until you find out the purpose of this attack that God allowed, that God helped to bring about because there is something bigger that he has for you. And I want to talk to you today about the purpose of scheduled attacks. If this is your word, let me see your hands in this place today. Give your neighbor a high five and say, God's about to do something in this place. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> Let's praise God for our praise and worship ministry. Amazing. All right. Write this down. This is very important. As long as... Is there, as long as there is an anointing on your life, this will be the rhythm of your life. Listen, this is the rhythm. Comfort, then conspiracy. Everything is working out. Where in the world did that come from? I'm on my way now. I didn't expect that. Think I found my person. That wasn't the one. About to introduce him to mama. I wish I'd have never met him. Holler at me. Because... Every person in the scripture that I looked for to give empirical data and evidence, their life was like the stock market, up and down. And here is why this is important. Because most of us came to God thinking that by giving God our life, the down was over. Because in, in your flesh, in your own life, doing your own thing, you had all of that. And you thought, okay, I'm going to join church. I'm going to give my life to God. I'm going to become faithful, and that should take care of the down. But I hate to be, <laughs> I hate to be the bearer of bad news. But there's down on this side, too. Amen. There's trouble over here, too. Like, after you've done all this shouting today, hell's still going to be at your house. And your boss still going to be ignorant. And you're still going to be underpaid. And you're still going to feel insecurity. And you're still going to battle with anxiety. It is not what happens to us. It is what God is actually trying to do through us. Wh wh whose attention do I have so far? Joseph, um, his daddy gave him a coat. Uh, his brother tried to kill him for it. Down. Lazarus was raised from the dead. Up. Uh, only to be killed by people who were jealous of the power of God. Or attempted to be killed. Down. Are you listening to me? David killed Goliath. That's what made Saul want to kill David. Because sometimes it is the thing that you were given that brings the enemy in your life that wants to take it. It is the coat. It is the crown. It is the position. It is the gift. It is the anointing. It is the promise of your future that sometimes gets the devil involved on a level in your life that he would have otherwise never paid you attention until you actually were blessed. Sometimes you have to be careful when you ask God for more because more of anything means more of everything. Y'all better hear me in this place. If you don't want to be attacked, 
stay unknown, stay broken and broke, stay frustrated, stay negative, do all of that. And he still might not leave you alone. But if you decide that you're about to change your life for the better, if you decide that you're about to get your courage up and start that business, if you decide, you know what? I, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to be the best parent I can be. I'm going to be the best wife I can be. Watch this. Every area where you decide to get better, the enemy has a troll to make it worse. Comfort, conspiracy. Good days, bad days. Feel like I can conquer the world? Feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. And how many of y'all sometimes just look in the mirror and feel like something's wrong with you because you can't get your rhythm? Sometimes you feel like you can handle the world and sometimes you don't feel like you can get out of bed. Come on, talk to me. I, I'm, I just need to know. I need to know if I'm talking to people. When you get around people, you talk bad. Oh, I ain't scared of nothing, but you scared as I don't know what. I mean, you, you actually are afraid and you talk tough, but you live weak. And, and, and then you look at your circle and you can't find strength there either. So you find out that all of your circle is infected with the same disease. The inability to believe, the inability to scale, the inability to go forward. I'm telling you that even Jesus himself went through this because the Bible says in Luke chapter 3 that Jesus was baptized by his cousin John the Baptist. Verse 1 of chapter 4 says, and immediately he was tempted by the devil. Good days. Who am I? I'm trying to get to... to, to to the right people, bad days. Yeah. I just gave my life to Christ and all hell broke loose. I just got a pay raise and then found out that I had a bill I didn't know nothing about. Up and down. Just, just when I thought everything was about to smooth out, then my car breaks down. Just when I thought that everything was going to be okay and I thought my children were going, then I get a call from the school telling me something happened that I didn't expect. I've been praying for this. I've been fasting for this. I've got, I've got comfort countered by conspiracy. And it is what Rabbi Adin Stouts says. He says this. Watch what he says. He says, it is the dilemma of being chosen. Oh, I'm going to talk to somebody in here today. He said it is the burden of being chosen. Joseph didn't ask for the coat. His daddy gave it to him. The Hebrew boys didn't ask for the fiery furnace. They were put inside of it. Let me tell you. Every time you look in the scripture, Paul didn't ask to preach. He was minding his business, walking on the road to Damascus. All of a sudden, the light hit his face, and he was blinded. I want to talk to people in here who will say, Pastor, I don't know why I'm going through this trouble, because I didn't even pick where the trouble came from. When Lazarus died, he didn't send a letter to Jesus and say, wake me up. He just so happened to be close enough to Jesus that Jesus came and woke him up. And when Jesus woke him up, then the Bible says that there was a conspiracy to kill Lazarus again. Why? Because when you have been chosen by God, you have also been chosen by his enemies. Who am I talking to in this place? You didn't think about that, did you? You didn't think about that when the Lord put his name on you. His competition wanted to end you. You have to understand that whenever you become friends with somebody, you also acquire their enemies. So when you became a friend of God, you became an adversary of the enemy. And every one of you in this place today, the devil has been after you since the day your mother conceived you and gave birth to you. And this is only the matriculation and the manifestation of an attack and a plot that has been warred against you since the day you were in your mother's womb. And even though it sounds depressing, that is not the point of the message. The point of the message is, is you were not supposed to be in this room today and somehow you made it. That you were not supposed to be watching online and somehow you made it. Some of your mothers contemplated abortions and you still made it. Some of your mothers were told that you would not survive the birth, but you made it. When you got here, the parents that you thought were your parents, some of you found out that those were not biological parents and you made it. Look at all of the things in your life that have transpired to keep you from getting to this place today. But I want you to look down your row and tell everybody we made it.
Tell somebody else, we made it. Now listen to this. In Acts chapter 23, it records the trial and the imprisonment of Paul in a place called Jerusalem on his way to Caesarea, uh, Capernaum. And the Bible says in Jerusalem, then when he gets to Caesarea, Paul isn't even read his Miranda rights. They do not tell him that he has the right to an attorney. They get him inside of the courtroom and Paul has to defend himself. And this is what I like about Paul. Paul says, y'all can say whatever y'all want to say about me, but watch what he says. I have lived my life and I don't have no guilt. God, help me in this place today. Tell, tell your neighbor, I, don't, I have a clear conscience. I, I just want to I just want to I just want to stop right here and tell you that with where you are going and the levels that God has for you, you're going to have to start living your life where you have a clear conscience. You can't owe no man nothing but to love him. Talk to me, somebody in here. Y'all quiet. You can't you can't owe nobody no money. You can't owe nobody a favor. You can't owe nobody a thank you. You're going to have to live your life with a clear conscience. That means you're going to have to treat people right who don't treat you right. That means you're going to have to apologize even if you don't feel like you were the one that was wrong. That means that sometimes you're going to have to speak when they ain't speaking. I'm talking to somebody in here because most of us live our life with an attitude which keeps us from acquiring our altitude. See, when you live your life mad at the world because the world didn't treat you right, then you cannot acquire what God has for you. I'm just looking for 50 people in the room to say, you know what? Though they slay me, yet will I trust in him. You can talk about me. You can lie on me. But you're not going to take this smile off my face. You're not going to take this joy out of my heart. And I'm cute even if you don't believe I am. I'm handsome even if you did not like to uh, compliment me. Matter of fact, just tell your role, I, I like this outfit. I liked it. I picked it. And if you didn't say nice outfit... I'll wear it again next week. I don't care what you think about me. I'm going to live my life with a clear conscience. You don't like my hair, either pay my hair bill or shut up and leave me alone. If you don't like my nails, either get them done for me or get out of my face. But I'm going to live my life with a clear conscience because I did not wake up with you on my mind. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Tell somebody, I came here for the Lord. Now, I'm talking to somebody. I came here for Jesus. And if you feel like I'm here for you, that's purely accidental. Congratulations. But I came for Jesus. Paul said, I lived my life with a clear conscience. I didn't do people wrong who did me wrong. And they don't know. Paul, Paul basically said, they don't know. They think I'm a preacher. They should have checked my resume and found out what I did before I started preaching. For all of y'all who don't know Paul, Paul was a murderer that became a Christian. That's why you got to be careful how you treat people who you think are meek. That, that's why you got to be careful how you handle people because they smile. And you will, you will flip a switch and make me go back to my Paul days. Slap your neighbor and say, it's a Paul in here. There's a Paul in here. I know you see my hand up in the air, but there's a killer in here. And please don't push me. Paul said, y'all, y'all don't know what set I claim. You don't know where I come from. You don't, you don't know where I come from. Come on, Christians. I know, I know y'all saved. I know you love Jesus. But anybody in here say, you got a little Paul in you. I can tell by looking at you. <laughs> you know, people come to church and they just be, oh. No, it's a club you in there. You ain't survived 10 years of the club being weak. Paul said, be careful. Now, now, let me tell you why Paul said, be careful. Because a lot of people like to glory in what they can do. You know, because you know, a whole lot of people think they're tough. A lot of people think they're tough ain't tough at all. Y'all know that, right? Paul says, now, I can get with you because I've been known to get with people. When Paul finished talking, here's what the Bible said. Now, some of y'all wouldn't have survived this part. The Bible says that Paul got to talking, they smacked Paul in the mouth. Look, look at you, look at you. Y'all ready to fight. Who? Paul, who? The one in the Bible, not your cousin, not that one. Paul said, listen, Pastor Phil, this is what Paul said. You can find it in the Bible. Roger, he said, be careful how you handle me. Because if you strike me, 
My God, you read it, my God is going to strike you. I got a word for everybody in this place today. God is going to strike everything that struck you. You better get, you better, hold on, it's about to go off up in here. It's about to go, I got Bible. Touch your neighbor and say, I got Bible. The Bible says that they threw the Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. What happened? The fire burned up the people who threw them in because if you strike me, God's going to strike you back. Y'all not here with me today. The Bible says that, that, that Joseph's brother threw him in the pit. But what ends up happening by the time you get to chapter 49, he is now second in command. There is a famine in the land and the thing they just so happen to be is hungry. And he is over the food distribution in the land. Why? Because if you strike me, one day I'm going to have to feed you. Y'all not here with me. Today, I want you to slap everybody down your row and tell them God's going to strike everything that struck you. Mess around and chase me to the Red Sea. It won't be but a few moments that you're going to drown in the thing you tried to drown me in. I need about 200 people in this room and about 500 people online to shout there is a purpose for my pain. But don't you take advantage of me while I'm in my struggle. Because if you strike me, God's going to strike you back. If you touch me, God's going to touch that which you love. That's why it is better for you to be the friend of a Christian than the enemy of somebody that God loves. Do I have any friends of God in this room today that can go ahead and relax and know that the Lord will fight your battles? God will protect that which concerns you. So if you chase me to the, drown, the, the Red Sea, just know you're going to drown in it. If you put me in the fiery furnace, know that I'm going to walk around in it and not smell like smoke. And it's going to burn you up from the outside of it. You'd be surprised how many people who think they can handle what you can handle, you live in it, they'll die outside of it. Y'all miss what I just said. Touch your name and say, you think you want my life, baby? You would die outside of my life. You don't have the anointing that I have. You don't have the prayer life that I have. You don't have the sustaining power. Do I have any praise warriors in here today? Touch your name and say, I didn't make it because I got money. I made it because I couldn't shut my mouth. I didn't make it because I had a pension plan. I made it because I stayed on my knees praying to the Lord in the midnight hour. I didn't get this far because of who I was connected to. I got here because there's a purpose on my life. I'm about to preach your whole life. I'm about to preach your whole life. Because Paul got so upset with these people, he started arguing with the high priest. How many of y'all got the kind of attitude that when you get mad? Come on, raise your hand if, if, if I'm talking to you. And everybody who doesn't have their hand raised, look at him and say, Pastor said, you ain't telling the truth. You a lie and the truth ain't in you. Everybody got a part of you in here. You always trying to hide it, but that joke of mean. Everybody here, you got a part of you that if you think of a plan. Okay, I'm going to set it on fire over here, but then. I'm a, if I poison the food, they you can't trace that one. It's Googling how to kill somebody without a trace. I, how to get away with murder. You was watching it. I seen you. Paul started arguing with the priest. He's like, I don't care. Y'all all getting on my nerve. They got Paul in the trial. Kangaroo court. No due process. About to put Paul away for good. Guess what his crime was? You want to guess? Loving Jesus. He didn't, do, he didn't commit a crime. His crime was that he wouldn't turn his back on God. You'd be surprised how many people hate loyalty. There are people right now who are upset with you because you didn't turn your back on somebody they couldn't remain loyal to. 
because your mom ain't raised you like that. Come on, talk to me. Who, who am I? You, you'd be surprised how many people mad at you because you didn't get mad at who they mad at with them. That's why God is looking for people who got their own mind. I, well, if you ain't did nothing to me, I ain't got no reason to be mad at you. You mess with me, it's a must that I mess with you. But if you ain't mess with me, we good. Paul says, I'm not turning my back on God because y'all did. You don't know what he's done for me. I've been shipwrecked. They tried to stone me to death and it didn't work. He was there for me when nobody else was there for me. Paul says, so if you strike me, I feel sorry for you. Because God's going to strike you back. And after a lengthy discussion, they finally determined, and this is what they're going to find out about you. This is why you got to wait. They tried to ambush him. And it finally came out that just like Jesus, they could find no fault in him. And I know it's a long road to wait. But eventually, they will find no fault in you if you've lived your life with a clear conscience. Most of us have that moment of weakness where we mess up what could be an eventual testimony because somewhere in there you get frustrated and you do something out of character. Paul says, nope, I'm not going to go back to being who I used to be. And somewhere along the line, you're going to have to stop praising God that you still got a little bit of that left in you. Because it's almost like a badge of honor. I'm still crazy inside. No, you got to get rid of it. Otherwise, you're going to give the court a reason to convict you. The point is to turn away from who you used to be. Not keep a little bit of it just in case you need it. Otherwise, you're not trusting God to strike. Come on. The fact that you still think you need it is a lack of faith. <clears throat> Believing that you can get an outcome that God cannot. <clears throat> oh, it's, it's, it's tight, but it's... They could find no fault in him. Later on that night, as they brought Paul inside of the castle and, and they brought him in, uh, the Bible says, now watch this. How, what did I tell y'all? Comfort, conspiracy. Now the conspiracy has happened. They take Paul inside of the castle back that night. And then the Bible says that the Lord comes and visits with him. Comfort, conspiracy. Now what's happening again? Comfort. Now the Lord is visiting with him. And the Lord is telling Paul, it's going to be all right, son. I got this. I, I got you. I can handle this. Don't you worry about it. Everything is going to be okay. And let me tell you something. Whenever your life is doing this, it's a signal that something great is about to happen. <laughs> Raise your hand if I'm talking to you online and in the place. Now, for all of y'all, if your life is doing this and everything is just good, and it's just going from glory to glory, <laughs> from blessing to blessing, matriculating from process to prosperity. God bless you. But for those of y'all, I can conquer the world. I can't wake up today. I got all the friends I can handle. Nobody even called to check on me. Who, who am I talking to? I feel beautiful. I feel ugly. I feel worthy. I feel worthless. Anybody deal with all of those emotions? And you can't let anybody know because it messes up your persona. But the truth is, most of us, no matter what we do inside, we never feel like we look outside. In fact, the reason why you keep working on the outside is trying to compensate for what's not taking place on the inside. Because there's some people, when you start the work from the inside out, you don't have to spend so much on surgery. 
No, no, talk to me. When, 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 when you work from the inside out, you don't have to buy a car so somebody will give you a compliment. Bro, when you work from the inside out, it don't matter if you're working at Amazon or if you own the truck. When you work on the inside out, then you have a confidence inside that recognizes that when you are the authentic you, there's somebody who will rock and ride with you all the way to the end. When you are insecure and you work from the outside in, then you dress up and go out and then you get mad anytime anybody looks at you funny because you don't want to realize that you actually think what you think they're thinking. And it is not that they think it, it's that you think they're thinking it. And so now you've placed your insides on their outside. That's why it's called insecurity. It starts from the inside out. Paul says, I know who I am. I know who called me. And I'm going to stand in this court and defend God and not myself. I don't have no help. That's a signal. When you got all of that coming at you at the same time, it's a signal. That something is about to pop off in your life. Look at your name and say, I'm, I'm dangerous right now. Like, like, I know it's about to go down in my life. Like, I just want to find 300 people. Like, I know for sure it's about to go down in my life. I, this, I'm, this is the year of manifested promises. I ain't never going to be broke another day in my life. This is the year of Jubilee. And I don't know what the Jubilee year is. I'm declaring it in the name of Jesus. How many even know you're about to have houses you didn't build? You're about to have vineyards you didn't plant. You're about to have oil. You're about to have anointing. You're about to have opportunity. God is about to put your name in the hearts and minds of great people. Your life is about to blow up. Did you hear what I said? I'm telling you what I know. You're not going to have car payments in this season. Just one. It's called cash. They're going to say, how many, how many payments you want? One. You're not going to be skipping the gap insurance trying to save money. All of that's about to happen. And you're shouting about it. But let me tell you what's connected to it. Conspiracy. Now all of a sudden you're sitting at a red light and somebody running to you that don't have insurance. Are you listening to me? Come here. Anytime your life is doing this, listen to what I am telling you. I mark my words. Breakthrough is coming. Anytime you're worried about your children and you see them vacillating and fluctuating, you're like, I know, I know they can do better. Breakthrough is coming. I got, I got grandparents in this room right now. I have parents in this room right now. I have young people who will make, anytime your life is doing this, I don't want you to get depressed. I want you to know this is the signal that breakthrough it's coming. I'm, I can't move on till you get it. Because how many, I, one, of our, one of our staff members said to me today, Pastor, you got to work because I need it. So I knew that the word was applicable when she said it to me because when, when you're going through all of that, it's the devil trying to vex your spirit so that you will become, listen, invested in the trick that the enemy has. You have to divest yourself from the chart of life and you just got to take charge of it and know that when this thing is going up and down it is a signal that breakthrough is about to happen who do who who am i talking to who believes who can sense who can imagine who can conceive that breakthrough is on the way slap everybody you can reach and tell them breakthrough is coming, breakthrough is coming, breakthrough is coming, breakthrough is coming, breakthrough is coming. It's a signal, breakthrough is coming. I know you feel the conspiracy, but the comfort is coming right behind it. Though you slay me, yet will I trust in you. I'm going to give you five seconds to open up your mouth because a change is on the way. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes.
Here's your first point. It just came to me. You ready? Here's the first lesson from me to you, South Campus, and those watching online, 2023. You ready? You got your notebook open. I know you got it. I'm going to give you time. You got yours. You ready? You ready? Learn from your enemies. Number one. Uh oh. Some of y'all are gonna miss that lesson, huh? <laughs> now, if you're ready for this heat, I got heat for you. And I got word, I'm about to back it all up. But in a year of manifested promises, you're gonna have to learn from your enemies. They are, listen, how many of you know you're great? So, what you must understand is that for somebody to be qualified as your enemy, they're great too. You better stop dismissing everybody who come up against you. You better stop dismissing them as ignorant and stupid because they're coming up against you. They don't know who they're messing with. You don't know who's messing with you. Learn from your enemies. Let's read the word of God. And when it was day, a group of Jews came together and made a pact that they would not eat or drink until they killed Paul. I don't have time to cover all of this. But I can tell you, if you trust me, that this is not the first time that this group has tried to kill this man. Since the day Paul had been converted in Acts chapter 9, this same group of people have been trying to kill him the entire time. Are you listening to me? I said, are you listening to me? Ever since he got started, this same group of people have been attacking him. They tried to beat him to death. That didn't work. They tried to do this kangaroo court thing. That didn't work. They tried to create a conspiracy about him. He survived that. And after all of those defeats, these rascals are back at it again, doing the same thing that didn't work before. Y'all better follow me because I'm about to give it to you. Not only that, not only did they not throw in the towel, the Bible says they increased their efforts. This time they say we're not even going to eat. We're not going to drink. Now, you got to understand. How long can you go without water? Who said it? Three days. That means they know that whatever they're trying to do is about to happen fast because they know that in, all they have is two to three days. So they say we're not going to eat or drink. So that means that they know by faith. That whatever they are setting out to do is going to be done within the matter of two to three days. Y'all not listening to me today. You better hear me. Because the one thing you need to learn from your enemies is work ethic. You need to learn from your enemies that whenever you set out to do something, you fast for it. God help me. That whenever you set out to do something, that you need to stop as a Christian, stop putting these long timelines on things that God is going to do in your life. By this time next year, I got a word for you. By this time Tuesday. Oh, God. I, I, only, I only need a few of y'all. The rest of y'all can go to sleep. Pastor Raymond will be back here next time. Listen, give your neighbor a high five and say, by Tuesday. The thing that I'm praying about is going to be done by Tuesday. The thing that I'm fasting about will be complete by Tuesday. My child will be an honor roll student by Tuesday. I'm going to have a million dollars in my bank account by Tuesday. By slap somebody and say, I got two to three days. Problem with Christians is we want everything taken. I'm just waiting on the Lord. 
I'm just waiting on it. It may not happen when it wanted to happen, but it, believe me, it's always on time. It may not come, but you know what? They didn't wait on the Lord's job and knew their strength. Shut up and get yourself up and say, in two or three days, everything that I touch is going to bless me. In two or three days, everything I think is going to happen. In two or three days, I shall live and not die. If I'm talking to you, raise your voice in this room. Slap your neighbor and say, sooner or later. Sooner or later. That's why you better not be looking at me funny because in two or three days, I'm about to blow up in two or three days. My name is going to be on the marquee in two or three days. I'm going to sign the contract in two or three days. Here's another thing. Don't you sit down yet. Because this is some of y'all sitting by people that don't have no faith. And that's fine. But don't let them date you when you get this blessing. So look at them right now. They sit down. You want my number. You better get it right now. Because next week you don't even try to holler at me. Don't look at me. Don't tell me I'm cute. You didn't say that when I was crying and looking ugly. So if you want me, you better shoot your shot now, dog. Watch this. The Bible says that they tried to kill Paul, listen to me, in Damascus, in Iconium, in Lystra, in Greece. The problem with us is we do everything locally. But what these demons knew is that they can do whatever they want to do wherever they want to do it. Don't you just open a business in Houston. You better open it in Miami. You better open it in New York. Don't just think that you're going to be useful on your block. You're going to own the whole block. Do I have anybody? Somebody shout in Greece, in Lystria, in Iconium. That means that whatever you're going to do, you can do it wherever you go. What I'm trying to get you to learn from your enemies is to think bigger. Why do Christians think so small? Since when did getting a car become a miracle? And why are you at my altar praying about a cell phone bill? If you start thinking bigger, You'll be down here saying, God, how can I get 7,000 shares of stock at AT AT&T? Now, how can I get them $190? I want you to touch all the big thinking people and say, we're going to think big together. (laughs) Who am I talking to? To Just tell them, you look rich. You... (laughs) Something done changed about you in five minutes. You look good when you got here, but you're looking richer and richer. It's just something that's changing about you. Matter of fact, just lift your head up like you just had a million dollars fall in your purse right now. Just lift. Think bigger. He did it every. They did it everywhere they went. They attacked him over here. Now, now, are you listening to me? Anytime, how many of y'all feel like everywhere you go, you kind of uh, you kind of experience the same type of thing? Like like you a nice person, but everywhere you go, you, you find out that people are kind of jealous of you. Are they always looking at you funny? How many of you? Anytime you go to different places and experience the same thing, you ain't, you're not paying attention. That's how you know what spirit is assigned to you. Let me tell you, if anybody ain't saying amen now, they're a hater. Tell them I said you're a hater because I'm preaching. Anytime you go, how you get to Miami and they acting the same? How you get to somebody's house that they, they don't even know you and they acting funny? How you just meet somebody last week and you already feel something strange about them? It's because you keep thinking you're dealing with people, but we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You are just now identifying, listen to me, shut your mouth. Whenever you deal with the same thing over and over, you have just been identified, whether you know it or not, 
by the spirit you struggle with. And you keep thinking it's them. But the reason why you encounter it everywhere you go is you have not yet found out that that is the spirit you struggle with, which is why it shows up in every region you go to. If you have problems with authority, it's because you struggle with the spirit of authority. If you are a woman and you don't have no female friends, it's because you struggle with a feminine spirit. If you are bro and you ain't got no friends, it's because you struggle with maybe a spirit where you can't hang out with any other alphas because you always got to be in charge. And if people are always gossiping around you, is that the spirit you've been assigned to or has been assigned to you? Every time you go to a place and you deal with the same thing, you have just now seen that the enemy is not as crafty as he believes he is. He has just identified. You have just seen what spirit has been assigned to you. And it is the spirit that you struggle with. Because the spirit that you do not struggle with, you resist. And what does the Bible say? When you resist the spirit, it flees. The reason why it won't flee is because you can't resist it. You got to always engage with it. And just because you didn't say it out loud, spirits recognize spirits. So when you deal with it internally, the spirit knows I got you. And when you subtly post on Instagram like the spirit don't know you're talking to it. Oh, y'all better holler at your boy. I'm coming for everything in this house today because this is the year manifested promises and you got to understand that this stuff is intentional. I ignore spirits that are assigned to me in their presence. But I am absolutely aware of them in their absence. I will never give a spirit assigned to me the satisfaction of me knowing that I know. And that's what a lot of y'all struggle with. You got to always let it. I just need them to know that I know. You don't need them to know that you know. You need them to know that you don't know. Because when they know that you know, they get crafty. When they don't know that you know, they get sloppy. Do I have anybody in the room talking to me? I got to go. I got to go. The reason why your enemies are so fortified is because you continuously let them know you know. Jesus never said nothing. Paul said, what y'all want to do? Where y'all want to go? How y'all want to handle this? You strike me, he going to strike you back. But we good, right? He did not. Okay. This, who am I helping? Because I got to quit. Let me just finish this. So that you understand that I'm not just talking hyperbole. Go back and read it on your own. Paul had a nephew. We heard about him one time in this story. Paul's nephew showed up for this incident. We don't see him no more. Paul's sister's son. Am I right about this, Ms. Walker? Showed up in the room. Now, see, the reason why I'm taking my time on this is because this ain't one of them stories that everybody knows. How many of y'all even knew Paul had a nephew in the Bible? You see what I'm saying? So Paul's nephew comes in the Bible. For one scene and one scene over. Now, I'm going to flip the script for a few moments here because everybody identifies as Paul in the text, but I need to find my nephews. Do I got some nephews in here? Where are my nephews and nieces at? Touch your neighbor and say, what's up, nephew? Okay. Paul is famous. Caleb, everybody knows Paul. His trial got more people at it than... Johnny Depp, and what's that girl? Amber. <laughs> Amber Heard. He got, he got all of the people. Everybody's at the court case. They're just watching. What's going to happen? What they going to do? What's the verdict? Because y'all know we nosy, ain't we? Wouldn't know. But if we go through trial, we don't want it out. We don't want nobody to see it, but we want to watch everybody else mess. And so what's going to happen to them? What, what's going to go on? But Paul got a nephew that don't nobody know. And because nobody knows him, 
He gets to walk in the court without being frisked. They don't pat him down. They don't ask him a question. And had they known it was Paul's nephew, they probably would have killed him on sight. Because in some seasons of your life, it's best not to be. See, everybody always trying to blow up. Everybody always trying to get known. But see, sometimes God holds your name back because he wants you to walk in rooms before you get put out of the room. He wants you to walk in a room before you get judged. So there are some nephews in here right now who can't figure out why my stuff ain't blowing up yet. Why has my idea not gotten traction yet? God says, I'm putting the quality in before the name goes out. And Paul's nephew walks right in the room with five followers on Instagram. He's got 12 on Twitter. He's got 16 on Facebook. And when he walks around the room, the Bible says that he gets to go directly to Paul and has a conversation with Paul, and Paul catches him up on everything that's been happening. Come here, Holy Ghost. Now, after he has the conversation, Brother Walker, with Paul, this dude does something that you will never, ever see in the Bible again. He goes right to the man in charge, the centurion, and says, bro, I need to have a meeting with you. Didn't schedule it with a secretary. And the Bible says that the centurion grabbed him by the hand and took him away and had a private meeting with him. Oh, my God. It is. It is. Because what you don't understand is that the stage you're in life right now that you keep talking about nothing is working for me, you don't understand that you own the precipice of a breakthrough. But if they knew who you were first, they would break you down. So sometimes God will keep you in obscurity so that you can accomplish the thing that he wants you to accomplish. It doesn't mean that you're not smart. It doesn't mean that he doesn't want to use you. It actually means he's about to use you around people who don't need to know who you are first. Because if he uses you around people who know you, then they will use you. So since he wasn't nobody... They wasn't trying to use him because y'all know how humans are. Oh, he ain't nobody. He, yeah, yeah, that's. Period. Period. I heard you. I heard you. Now, see, see, y'all laughing at she in this message. Because what you have just witnessed, she has thrown Paul away. She done stepped in this story herself. And that's the only way the Bible works for you. If you think I'm talking about Paul and his nephew, you're going to miss the message. Put yourself right in there that God is using you to be able to walk in the rooms. And, walk, and, and listen, people walking right past you like you ain't nothing. But they don't understand that you are actually the key to their destiny. So you better slap your neighbor and say, you ain't spoke to me all day. You ain't gave me a high five yet and you don't even know God sent me here to get you out. Oh God, I feel glory in the room. Slap somebody say, God sent me in here to get you out. Look at, look at the person next to you. Look at him. Look at him. Look at him. They ain't said nothing to you yet. They ain't gave you a high five. Listen, every time I tell you to talk to your neighbor, they... But what you don't understand is God sent me in this room, and I'm the key to the door that has you bound. Give me a high five. Somebody give me a... Give him a high five. Shout, you just got unlocked. <laughs> God put me on assignment to make sure that all things work together for your good. Now let the redeemed of the Lord shout yes. What I was saying, my sister, is that they don't know that even though they don't know you, God sent you in the room because you are actually more powerful now than the person who's known. The unknown person that will never be in the story again and at this moment is about to be the key to somebody's destiny. You're always trying to find out what your destiny is. You better find out whose destiny you need to unlock. Because sometimes 
your gift in life is to be the gift. No, 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 hear me. Because everybody thinks, oh, what's my purpose in life? Well, then when I find my purpose, I'm going to blow. No, sometimes your purpose is to unlock somebody else. There is Jesus, but then there is John the Baptist. And sometimes God will send you to unlock somebody's destiny. And history will always remember you because your destiny was to help somebody else find theirs. Who am I talking to? Nobody ever heard of this boy before. Marlon, you ain't, I, I, I only heard of him once. I ain't, I ain't seen him again. He don't even have a name. We don't even know his name. But we know what he did. He walked in unknown, related to somebody who was, and went to the man in charge, the centurion. Now, you know the centurion is like the warden over the prison. Okay, so when you see the word centurion, century, it means he had thousands of men under him. Okay, so, so when, you, when you look at this man, Paul walks in, goes right to the centurion, and he says, <laughs> he says, listen to this. He says, uh, I advise you. <laughs> Y'all don't read the Bible like I read it. Is this not exciting to you? I just, he walks in and says, I advise you to let Paul go and send him to Felix, who is the governor of Rome. And I advise you to do it today. And the Bible says that night. <laughs> Listen to me. That night, a prisoner who was about to be killed has now been sent to Rome. I'm about to show you the purpose, and I ain't even got there yet. Has now been sent to Rome. And the Bible says that the, the centurion sent 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 archers. So he says all about between 500 and 600 soldiers to be bodyguards. For a felon. Watch this. And all of them had to walk. But if you read the Bible, they said, and give Paul a horse. So here Paul is riding on the horse. While all the free people are walking. Can I tell you that God is about to take you above your enemies. And the people who are laughing at you now are gonna have to watch you ride into your next level. Slap somebody and say, you can laugh at me now, but God is gonna make my enemies my footstool. I even imagine that Paul stepped on one of them to get on top of his horse. And it gets better. The purpose for scheduled attacks. Paul is now on a horse. <laughs> and they walking. Now, have you ever seen Django? How many of y'all seen it before? When Jamie Foxx was on that horse? And all of the people who worked for Mr. Calvin Candy was walking? You'd be surprised at how much frustration your elevation is costing your life. And here you are arguing with people who don't have a horse. Here you are in your comments with walkers while you're a writer. And the reason why you're frustrated, look at your pastor. The reason why you're frustrated is because they know you're a writer, but you don't see it in yourself. Because every person I see you arguing with is the person that you see yourself as. You ain't never seen me argue with no three-year-old. We ain't on the same level. 
what we got to talk about. At the level you get my attention for me to argue, I have just identified where I see myself. Paul said, I'm a rider. I'm a rider. Tell your neighbor, I'm a rider. I'm a rider. And here they are, just walking. Y'all know people be mad, don't they? Who that on that nag? They mad. Mad, mad. Big mad. And they get there. That, I don't even know if I got time to get y'all this whole thing. <laughs> and when they get there, now, I need y'all to bring up verse number 11 because this is going to crack the case. Okay? Because what is actually happening now is scheduled. And what I'm trying to get you to understand is that sometimes it feels accidental. But Keith, this is intentional, sir. Whatever you are dealing with in your life right now is on purpose. God is not too dumb to not make it work together. It may feel like it to you. But I promise you on a stack of Bibles, anybody got one? I'll put my hand on it. She got a Bible. I love people that bring Bibles to church. I put my hand on this Bible that it is intentional. Everybody say intentional. intentional. That night the master appeared to Paul. It's going to be all right. This is God talking to him. Everything is going to turn out for the best. You've been a good witness for me in Jerusalem. Go to the next verse. Now you're going to witness in Rome. Where is Felix? They just found out he going to Rome. He knew. God had already told him in verse 11 that he was going to Rome. So now when they put him on this horse, making him trying to make him think like he's doing a favor, they don't know that that night God had already told him what was going to happen. So I can imagine that he was up in the, in the cell like any minute now. <laughs> Any minute now, they're going to come in here. Uh, Paul just wanted you to know, change your plans. We're going to Rome. Don't be shocked. Paul like, Phew. God already told me last night that I was going to go to Rome. If you absolutely are listening to me today, and if you are paying attention to the words that are coming out of my mouth, you should not be shocked when you get to conspiracy because I've already told you. But I've also told you after conspiracy comes comfort. See, the reason why you're so distressed is you're not listening to God. He's already told you what's next. Weeping may endure for a night. Joy comes in the morning. But if you're texting right now, if you're on Instagram right now, if you, are, if you have blocked me out right now, then you're going to come to the altar praying about what God already said. And God does not provide miracles where he's already given a message. I promise you, ain't nothing going on in your life right now unless your house on fire important enough for you not to be looking up. Paul is on a horse on his way to the place that God told him he was going. Let me tell you. If God told Paul, he also told them. They think this is their idea. God got your back so much that he tells you what your enemies are about to do to you. And you ready for what they're about to do. They still planning it. And when Paul gets to Rome, God help me in this place. Oh, this is a series. When Paul gets to Rome. You got to read all the way through Acts 26 to get this. When he gets to Rome, he gets in front of a guy named King Agrippa. Now, look at how, he, how his life is matriculated. He started off with these low-level centurions in a dungeon with a no-name nephew. Now, he is in the presence of a king. 
Now he's in the presence of King Agrippa. You got to read Acts 26 and 28 to get it. Just pull it up. Just pull it up. Just pull it up. Pa Paul, is, Paul is up there saying, I, I, didn't, I didn't do anything. I didn't do nothing. They just, they, just, they just brought me here. They didn't give me a chance. They, they, they tried to assassinate my character. I, I, all, of this, all of this stuff that's going on in my life, I, I, don't, I don't understand what's going on. I didn't do anything. I've just been believing and praying and fasting. And Felix sends a letter. And in the letter it says, now listen to this. This is why you got to be careful with people uh, when you're struggling because sometimes when you're struggling, you're not paying attention. Felix writes a letter to Agrippa and says, um, we found Paul and they was about to kill him, but I saved him. I saved him and I brought him back to life. Bro, you the one who put him in jail. Listen, don't let people change the story. He, he, he didn't do that. But he was trying to make himself look good in front of Agrippa. Why? Because Paul was a Roman citizen. I know I'm teaching you too much right now. You're going to have to go back and watch this. Paul was a Roman citizen, and because Felix was in Jerusalem, he didn't have jurisdiction over him. That's why you have to have extradition treaties. And so he was honoring the extradition treaty, saying, I didn't have jurisdiction over his life, but I brought him to you so you can handle him. Yeah. And Paul gets to talking to Agrippa, and he says the same thing that he says to Felix, and I promise you the words out of Agrippa's mouth shocked me. Agrippa, after Paul finishes pleading his case, Agrippa said, Paul... You make me want to be a Christian. Now remember what verse 11 said, that you have to witness for me in Rome. The reason why Paul had to be locked up in Jerusalem and sent to Rome by Felix to get in the presence of Agrippa, because if Agrippa would pronounce Jesus as Lord. As king, so would everybody beneath him. Everything that Paul went through was so that the gospel could get to Rome. That's why it's called the Roman Catholic Church. This is the first time that Christianity got to Rome, which was the epicenter of the world. It was the America of that day. Had the gospel not gotten to Rome, it wouldn't be in America. Because just like America influences the world and culture, Rome did at that time. If the gospel hadn't gotten to Rome, it wouldn't have been in America. And if it hadn't got to America, it wouldn't be in you and I. So we are saved because Paul. But you will miss it if you don't understand that it was scheduled. That thing you going through got a purpose bigger than your tears. You don't know how many other people are going to be able to come out because you survived it. And if you can get better and not bitter, you will find out that this was scheduled and intentional. And Agrippa, an evil man, says, Paul, you make me want to be a Christian. Yeah. After you finish struggling and after you finish fighting, everybody who watched you come through it should be able to say, you make me want to be a Christian. Yeah. If I can't watch you struggle, and want to be like you, you didn't handle your struggle right. Everybody say the point of it all. If you can just find out that it got a point. Stop pointing fingers and just find out the point. <laughs> 